so theatrical coming on from that set. Fantastic. Lovely to see you. Thanks so much for coming and welcome to this absolutely brilliant venue. We were here last summer at a little gathering and it's lovely to be back, particularly today, uh, because for us kindred spirits, uh, this day has a, a certain very delightful significance. Yeah, Mark and I have often said that the definition of a rock star is that you spend your time thinking, I wonder what they're doing right now. And I suppose the definition of a very, very big rock star is that you can actually throw an 80th birthday party for them without requiring their presence at <laughs> all. And uh, that's certainly the case with James Paul McCartney, who was born on this day 80 years ago when Rommel was ch still chasing the Allies around the Western Desert, which is a considerable long time ago. Uh, talking of length of time ago, there, there may be a very tiny minority of people in this, in this place who, like me, remember the world before the Beatles. Would anybody care to identify themselves as being somebody who remembers the world before the Beatles? We got the very old one. So thank you very much for being so honest. But obviously, for most of us, we don't remember a world before Paul McCartney. Uh, when the Beatles first landed in the USA in 1964, an American journalist said something very perceptive. He said, they seemed a new kind of people. And I think there's a lot of truth there. And the new kind of people that they were, because he played a part in our lives when we were kids, and he still plays a part in our lives today. So that's what we're hoping to explore uh, between now and about half past four, quarter to five this afternoon for your entertainment and enlightenment. And there's going to be a little uh, intermission in the middle. Now, since Sandy Julia Rayside can't be with us because of unforeseen circumstances, we have four guests, all of whom have very, very interesting connections in history with McCartney. And we're going to ask all four of them the same four questions first when they come on. And I shall start by putting those questions today, in fact. When did McCartney first uh, enter your life? Can you remember? When he must have entered my life when I was 12 years old, living in the West Ride of New Yorkshire. So this would be 1962, when our, uh, our kind of magazine programmes on television very often came to us. Those Tea Time magazine programmes came via Granada in Manchester, who were the first broadcaster to actually carry them on programmes like Calendar, I think, and People and Places. But the first time, the first distinct memory that I have of a relationship with Paul McCartney and the Beatles goes to November and coming up to Christmas, 1963, when my sister and I got with the Beatles for Christmas. And we just thought this was immensely exciting. And on the, at Christmas, as, was, as happened every year, my Uncle Stan used to visit, and Uncle Stan came from Stockport, so you can imagine how sophisticated Uncle Stan was. Uncle Stan wore a cardigan which had suede facings and uh, followed the career of Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and so forth. And uh, he used to delight in taking the mickey out of me and my pop enthusiasms. And he said, so what do you like now? And I proffered this album with the Beatles. And he looked at it and he turned to me and he said, look, listen to me. He said, I'm going to come back next Christmas and you will have forgotten all about the Beatles. <laughs> Where the poor soul, for the rest of his life, he came every Christmas. And every Christmas I was there to greet him with whatever was my latest Beatles album or Paul McCartney album. Uncle Stan's long gone nowadays, but I like to feel... He's looking down right now and seeing us celebrating the 80th birthday of Paul McCartney and tearing out what, hairy, what little hair he had left. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's how Paul McCartney first entered my life. What about you? Well, for me, I, mean, I think I was about eight when the Beatles first appeared and uh, my parents um, gave me the greatest gift that any parents can give someone, which is they loathed and detested pop music. Oh, so they absolutely hated it, which makes it even more precious. 
And we didn't have a telly and we didn't uh, have any pop radio. So, um, you know, I was completely unaware of, of Love Me Do. But about two months later, I think we were having supper, me and my three elder sisters and my parents. And one of my sisters won a prize at school. And my father pointed out that she had squandered 32 and 6 of it uh, on this cacophonous record by these reprehensible looking people. There was a massive argument. My sister stormed out and went upstairs. I could hear her slamming the door and putting on the record loudly, hearing it through the ceiling. And I went up after supper and opened the door and that image of her is my abiding memory of my first encounter with the Beatles because there she was with her, with her Helen Shapiro back comb and her, and her plastic earrings having kicked off her shoes and her with a hot, tear-stained face, dancing angrily to All My Loving with Please Please Me propped against the dance set. So for me, The Beatles wasn't a, a multi-generational entertainment. It was the soundtrack of teen rebellion, for which I'm very grateful. Absolutely. I thought it was wonderful. So next question, have you ever met him? Yes, I've met him a few times. First time I met him um, was in, in the course of a meeting uh, because we were doing a special magazine for him for a tour he was doing in the early 90s. And uh, so we had a meeting at Soho Square as his office. And it's usual thing, you know, you, when, you, when you meet incredibly famous people like that, on the face of it, you're calm and blasé. And underneath you're going, it's, oh my God. <laughs> underneath you're weeping, you know what I mean? And you just can't get, uh, wait to get away and tell people about it. But anyway, I said it would be a good idea in this, um, in this magazine if we had some memorabilia. I said, do you have any memorabilia? Do you keep stuff? He said, yeah, I keep a fair amount of stuff. He said, get them in the office. They'll, they'll let you look at it. And so the office allowed me and Caroline Grimshaw, I don't know if Caroline Grimshaw's here today, she probably is, um, to, to go to what enormous great lock-up in Hackney, which at the time was where he kept what was apparently the key to every city in the United States, a huge collection of gold discs, and also the coat that he wore, the jacket that he wore on the cover of Sgt Pepper. Now, you probably think I was far too restrained <laughs> to try it on. you still got it, haven't you? <laughs> You'd be wrong. <laughs> I tried it on. I had my picture taken wearing it. And every now and again, it pops up in my Apple photos. And then the longer ago it seems, the more amazing it seems that we did that, you know. So, yes, that's, that was the first time I met him. What about you? Well, I think I've interviewed about, about eight times. The first time I met him was in 1982, two years after the death of John Lennon. It was the first interview I think he did after the death of Lennon. And I was told I mustn't mention John Lennon, understandably. And same with you. I mean, I was absolutely hyperventilating. I, I, was, I, was, I was kind of hypnotised with, with kind of uh, awe and, and excitement. And uh, again, trying to suppress the internal feeling while wishing everybody I'd ever met in my entire life could be there to witness this yes. moment. I mean, everyone, everyone, look what's happening, you know. And what I remember was his, A, his enormous charm, B, his brilliant ability to give journalists precisely what they want, his understanding of what headline they're looking for. And I kind of woke up at one point, because I could hardly hear a word he was saying, and, and found him talking about John Lennon in the 60s, which is perfect, because I needed to write about John Lennon and needed to address that in the piece. And I remember when I talked to him in, for the Radio Times, for the last Jubilee, must have been, what, the, the 60th Jubilee. And uh, he came up with this wonderful quote about the Queen. He described uh, Her Majesty as a babe, which is just brilliant. <laughs> it's kind of cheeky and really, really... It's impressive. Radio Times quote. It's Radio it, Times quote. And, and the Radio Times All over says. the world. And I can remember the two of us looking at each other and he said, that. He said we don't really need to talk yeah, anymore. Yeah. It's in the bag. Yeah. So he's an absolute genius. Yeah, yeah. What's your favourite Paul McCartney story? Um... Well, I've got, I've got a, just a couple of really short ones that I think are interesting because they, they show different sides of his character. One is 1966, when they'd been touring incessantly and recording forever. They hadn't had any time off for years, really. And he felt imprisoned by his celebrity. And he was on holiday in France, and he decided to he just missed anonymity. And dressed up with a, with a, with a false moustache and glasses and brill creamed his hair back and tried to get into a club in Bordeaux. And it wouldn't let him in. So he went back to the hotel room and, and got rid of the disguise and came back as Paul McCartney, which, of course, he was working with open arms, riotous reception. And at that point, he realised that there was some advantage 
to being famous. It was a major turning point in his life. And a lot of the way he didn't just sit about that, sit and think about that. It was a practical application. And the other is just a really touching story, I think, when uh, Cynthia Lennon fell on hard times later in life and she sold a letter that John had written to her in, in 1965 when he was on tour expressing great affection and homesickness. And uh, it was really sad she had to sell it, really, and it sold to an anonymous bidder on an auction for a huge amount of money. And, of course, two days later, it was sent back to her door, framed, and with a little note from Paul saying, this belongs to you and Julian, which I thought was really, really touching. Extraordinary. My favourite McCartney story, you're always attracted to the bits of people that you, you admire yourself. And I'm a huge admirer of really hard work. I, I, could, I could watch it all day, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> No, I, 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 and uh, McCartney is, is a very, very hard worker. And there's a fantastic example of this that he talks about in the, the book of lyrics that came out not long ago. Uh, during the recording of Abbey Road, I think it was, he decided he was going to write a song for Badfinger. And so he just went downstairs to the, to the, the music room in his place in Cavendish Avenue in, in St. John's Wood and played quietly so he didn't wake Linda. He wrote a song. And then the following morning, half an hour before the Beatles were due to arrive for a session, he got into the studio, he recorded a drum track, he recorded the bass track, he recorded the piano, he recorded the vocal, he mixed it, and that was Come and Get It, which he gave to Badfinger and said, just do it like that, okay? <laughs> which, is, which is very, very good advice. And I can't help thinking that there's part of him that the reason he did that kind of thing is so that somebody like me will be telling that story many, many years later. So I massively admire the, the work ethic of Paul McCartney. So, and the final question we're going to put to all our guests. You were going to ask all our guests, yeah, favourite song. And I, I, I was going to mention, obviously millions to choose from, but I was going to mention for lots of reasons, some of them just technical actually, which is Penny Lane. I think Penny Lane is absolutely extraordinary. Penny Lane is in my ears and in my eyes. It's, it's, a, movie, it's a little miniature movie with a soundtrack. You can hear Penny Lane in the late 50s with its brass bands and its fire engine. You can see Penny Lane as the camera pans across that area by the bus stop. Um, you know, all the little details. The three main characters, it's just like a film script. Three main characters have a verse each, the barber, the banker, um, the, uh, the fireman. And in the last verse, all three of them meet up again in the barber's shop. It has a wonderful kind of circular nature to it. It also has a, 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 an amazing kind of, it's like a psychedelic fever dream, I think, in which it is simultaneously pouring with rain and blue suburban skies. And lastly, I think, it has one of those melodies, it's very rare, actually, melody, which is launching upwards as the chord sequence goes down. So you get this incredible feeling of, of uplift. And I don't think there's nearly enough credit for songs that are simply written to, uh, to, to, to raise the human spirit, actually. Yes. It's very easy to write songs that are miserable and mordant and uh, self-analytical, and rock critics particularly identify with that kind of thing. But I think there's uh, not enough credit for songs that are simply there to be optimistic and, and upbeat. I think Penny Lane a, is a brilliant example. Well, mine is, actually, I was thinking about this. I was 12 when I first heard the Beatles and I don't think I'd kissed a girl when I was 12 years old. I was, I was 13 when I got with the Beatles, and I think I had kissed a girl by then. And all the Beatles' early records were what I call personal pronoun pop. You know, they're all, put yourself in this situation. And they were all about the excitement of being in love, or feeling that you ought to be in love. And even if you haven't, didn't have a significant other to be in love with, you were encouraged to be in love with the Beatles. Because that was what they were selling, that delight in being in love. And so the record that I would choose to explain Paul McCartney to a Martian in the sense that if you don't get what's wonderful about this, you don't get what's wonderful about pop music, is All My Loving, which starts with what I still consider the greatest opening line in pop music, close your eyes and I'll kiss you. And, and that delight... It's still, you know, when I play a copy of With the Beatles now, all those years later, it still makes me feel 14 and just kissed a girl for the first time. So that's, uh, that's my choice. <laughs> You're listening to a podcast from The Word. 
So let's bring on the first of our four guests this afternoon. Uh, the first is an old friend of the pod who's been a regular host on Virgin Radio and Absolute Radio, BBC Five Live and other places. He's won two gold awards from the Radio Academy. He presents the podcast Reasons to be Cheerful with Ed Miliband. But the reason he's here today, apart from being an old mate, is that whenever he's had access to a microphone, he's used that access to talk about the Beatles and Paul McCartney. Would you please welcome Jeff Lloyd. Are you all right, Toby? You go there. Mega. Let's go and get on that one. The, the length of the entrance is longer than any round of applause that I would deserve. So if I did that, that little jog, it wasn't energy, it was nervousness. So, so Jeff, the, the four, four questions. When did Paul McCartney first enter your life? Well, I was born in 73, so after the Beatles split up. And I, I feel it's a bit... I was thinking about it on the way here, it's a bit like, I imagine, kind of um, being in Camelot after those knights of the round table have been off and done their quest, and they're, what do those guys... Yeah, you're aware of them. All of them I was aware of. Um, I, I can't remember not being aware of them, but also, you know, they, they seemed like they belonged to a different time, to the extent that there was a guy, um, an old man called Mr Cutbush, who used to come into our school and play piano. And, um, it, you know, it's all stuff like my grandfather's clock and lots of old standards. And, and when I'm 64 was in there as well. So even by then, by the 1970s, that music was it, it, like it didn't belong to anybody. It was just part of everything by then. Um, so him, him individually, I, I, like, I remember seeing him on things like maybe Swap Shop or Saturday Superstore. He was like, a, a, always a presence, um, but it, it belonged to the fabric of everything by then, I think. But, but you knew him as a solo performer yeah. rather than a Beatle. Yes, and you know, I I, um, I was a child like when the the Frog Chorus came out, so I had a fondness for that. So all those '80s records, you, you just hear everything back then because all, all it was either Radio Two, which played big band music, or the pop stations played everything going back to the beginning of um, beginning of the rock and pop era. Because it seems so interesting to, to Dave and I, because we're old enough to have seen all the Beatles records chronologically. So whenever a record came out, you knew what the one before had been, and yeah. you knew what had influenced it, and you saw it all as a progression. But for you, you were just going back, and you could randomly alight at all sorts of parts of his career. And... Yeah, and, and um, I, I got into the Beatles through Plastic Ono Band, which thinks such a str- with hindsight, is such a strange way. Because it, I had that thing where, where uh, I, I was just aware of them, and you'd still hear in the 80s things like I Want to Hold Your Hand or She Loves You or Hello Goodbye on the Radio with regularity, but I'd never delved into them. I knew there was a reverence, and then I'd started working in radio, and somebody gave me a copy of Plastic Ono Band, which had just been reissued, and said, listen to this, and I went in a little room and thought, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. Now I have to start buying the Beatles records. And I think I started with Sgt. Pepper and then fanned outwards from there, but I really envy anybody who got to hear it with fresh ears. It must have just been the most amazing thing. But my par- parents had no interest. Mum was this huge Elvis fan, and my, my dad prides himself on being able to spot a number one. I'm not sure he should be f- f- proud of that, because like, often, that means we've got like a box of right old shit in our house. <laughs> You know, um, some of it's great, but like there's a lot of kind of awful things like Bobby Goldsboro, honey, and and he's one of these people who will pride himself on. Well, I was never that fussed with the Beatles. Like, why why isn't that a source of shame for you? You know, you you, you were one of those people who made sure Engelbert Hem- Humperdinck kept Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields off number one. Like, you you're, you you should be held responsible. There should be something like the Nuremberg trials for people like you. <laughs> So the second question is, have you ever met him? You've met him. Yeah, so I'm I'm lucky enough to have um, met him lots of times through my job. Um, The first time was on Run Devil Run. And I didn't know I was going to meet him. I I got invited to the album launch. I'd I'd moved from Manchester to London. Up until that point, the closest I'd got to Paul McCartney is a friend of mine worked on a TV show called That Show Business with Mike Smith. 
and Mike McCartney was on it, and I got to be in the green room at the same time as Mike McCartney, Paul's brother, and that, that was so exciting that I'd got that one degree of separation from a Beatle, that was enough for me. And, and then we were invited to the album launch of Run Devil Run, but it was at the same time as we were on the radio, and this was Virgin Radio when Chris Evans owned it. So we thought, well, it's, it's, we're in Golden Square in Soho, it's just around the corner in Leicester Square, so we could probably put an hour of the show on tape it's the evening, no one will notice, and we'll be fine. So that's what we did. We left someone playing it out, and we sneaked out and, and went to this thing. And on the way in, I bumped into somebody I knew and got talking to them. And the people I was with went into the party, and I could see them being introduced to Paul McCartney in the distance, whilst I was making polite small talk with an acquaintance. And I thought, I'm missing my chance here, I'm missing my chance. And I kind of said, I'm sorry, I've got to go. And I arrived to my group, just at the point Paul was saying goodbye. And I just shook his hand and went, yeah, it was nice to meet you, like I'd been in the conversation. Like he wouldn't notice I hadn't been in the conversation <laughs> and I'd just appeared out of nowhere. But then, um, you know, I was, I was lucky in that we interviewed him after that and he came back on the radio show loads of times, like 14 or 15 times, I think. And uh, yeah, and, and I think he really likes a combination of irreverence and respect. You did some brilliant things with him. Yeah, yeah, on Absolute Radio, you did a show where you got him on, and firstly you gave him a load of instruments to see if you could play them. You yeah. gave him a flugel horn, I yes. think, at one point. And he got an amazing tune out of it, didn't he? Yeah, and then yeah. you did this other thing. Explain that, we've got people on who hadn't finished their songs, and they wanted a oh, middle yeah, age. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we got my co-host, Annabelle, yeah. like, wrote a song. Because he's, I always like that idea that John would bring a song and Paul would finish it off, or vice versa. And, like, our understanding of that has changed so much. I think since Get Back um, but yeah he, he wrote a song about tomatoes but she'd kind of written it to imply it was not about meat you know, she's impl beef tomatoes and so on and I was really nervous because I didn't know what she was going to do but it was so game you know it's like, like a publicist will usually keep an artist will have instructed the publicist keep me away from anything like this yeah, yeah. and he would just sort of go along with anything um, when I got together with my now wife her mum was a big Beatles fan in the 60s, but her favourite was Ringo. And I was off to interview Paul, and I remembered, you know, they could all do each other's autographs. So I, I went in an old, like, vintage comic shop and, and bought an old 8x10 headshot of Ringo, and then asked Paul if he'd mind signing it as Ringo. And he, he did it, and she's got it up in a, in a spare bedroom. He's, he's so game. He's really lovely. <laughs> Because, yeah. uh, you, Mark, you ought to explain this. They could all do each other's autographs, because you've seen... Well, I interviewed George, George, yeah. George Harrison, and uh, I, I took along, as a bit of an icebreaker, I took along uh, my wife's um, picture that she sent off to the Beatles fan club um, uh, when she was, however, 10 or something like that, a picture she'd cut out of the, of the melody maker or something, and it had come back with all their autographs on it. And I said to him, Is there, are these genuine, you know? And he said, I don't think they are. I think they were probably mostly done by me. And he then demonstrated himself doing it, which yeah. is incredible. The great big squiggle under the John Lennon, the Ringo Starr with a little star, yeah. the Paul McCartney with a great big Y. And it was just a brilliant thing that they did. And uh, who cares? I mean, yeah. nobody got hurt. No. I'm sure there are lots of Ringo yeah. Starr autographs. Neil Aspinall or Mel Evans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think if you've got a Beatle doing all four, that's quite exciting. Exactly, exactly. So what's your favourite McCartney story? Um... I, d I don't know, you know, like, so, like, I, don't, I heard one a, a while ago, do you know who Ted Robbins is? You know, Kate Robbins, the, uh, the comedian and impressionist who's Paul's second cousin. Oh, yeah. She's also got, I, th I don't oh, know if he's a the twin the brother or, but yeah, yeah he, he, he was in, I think, Phoenix Nights, but he's best known as a, a warm-up man. Uh, he does all those like Granada, shiny floor, light entertainment shows. And um, he, he told me a story that a TV company had approached him um, a few years ago to, uh, to host a programme about the cavern and the Mersey Beat scene, and he was really flattered to be asked. Um, you know, he's a local radio DJ on BBC Manchester now. So, so he says, sure, I'm, I'm up for it. And then, of course, in the first meeting, they say, um, so is there any, any chance you could, uh, you could get an interview with Paul for us? And, and he has to say, look, you know, in, in the family, it doesn't quite work like that. There are certain boundaries. And, um, you know, if, if you would like me to, uh, you know, there's somebody at Paul's office who organises that side of things and, and I can contact them. But, you know, I know he's busy with this, this and this at the moment and, and it's, uh, it's not going to happen. Um, but I'll, I'm happy to do it for you. 
So they say, yeah, that'd be great if you could. So he contacts MPL or whoever it is, and, uh, and sure enough, the, the answer comes back, no. And then a few weeks later, his phone rings, and it's Paul. And Ted answers, and says, hi, Paul. He says, um, hey, Ted, you know, if, um, if you ever want me to do something, you know, you, you don't need to ring the office and then have them tell you to, uh, to fuck off. Ring me directly and I'll tell you to fuck off. <laughs> so it's this other side of him. Yeah. 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 I mean, it is interesting how he, he just has to negotiate this relationship where he's so familiar, he's so famous, that he has to kind of play with it a bit, doesn't he, really? I, last time I met him, he, I was always amazed by the fact that he goes, oh, yeah, you. And I think, you don't remember me at all. And then I think to myself, well, actually, if you're Paul McCartney, you've met everybody in the world, and the people you haven't met are not going to deny it, are they? You know what I mean? <laughs> and therefore, you, you, can, you, know, you can have a different relationship with people. I seem really good with that stuff, though. I've, I've talked to Barry Miles before, you, who did the uh, authorised biography with, and Barry says like, he's got a terrible memory for everything else, but maybe his head is just full of um, people's faces, names, and one friendly detail about them. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's that thing, I know everybody says it, but if he would ever come into the radio station, if um, you know, there was somebody from the accounts department in the lift with him, he, he would make that a pleasant experience. He'd have a little chat with them. And, and it, if, if you don't know him, if you, that, that could sound like somebody walking through the world with sort of an inflated sense of self, which I don't think it's possible to have if you're Paul McCartney. But actually, I think it's, it's, it's this thing that's really integral, integral to him of, of just being nice and making the world... Making people happy, I think. Yeah. It's as simple as that. You know, if he just says hello to people, yeah. they all go off and tell 30 people. The people get it in their head that it's, the, it's, it's you know, the ultimate PR man, which I think he is in some respects, but I don't think it's just that. I think it's, he, he thinks that's the way people should behave. It's interesting, because I remember interviewing Rod Stewart once, and he said, Rod Stewart said, I never go out without a pair of dark glasses on, so that no one can make eye contact with me. So it looks that they can't approach me, really, and it doesn't look like I'm ignoring them. And Van Morrison said the same thing about talking to a uh, mobile phone. You know, he goes out and talking to a mobile phone so no one can approach him. You know. So people set up these defences. But McCartney does precisely the opposite, doesn't he? He actually he has this method where he just keeps walking really, really fast because he's heading somewhere. So he hasn't got time to stop and talk yeah. and take selfies, but he'd give you a little thumbs up. Yes, yeah. And that's an extraordinary gift, really, isn't it? It is. The way, the way they sort of move... It, it, like, his thing is keep moving. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that must have been true for all of them. Yeah, yeah. And that just must be muscle memory. Yeah. That's what they had to do, you know? they couldn't keep moving or it ends up like you know, the beginning of a hunt. He still gets on the train on his own. He still gets on the train on his own from Sussex. Yeah. I, think, I think, so there's no way you can be Paul McCartney and live a normal life, but I think the idea of normality is really important to him. I think he, he on some level, understands that that's how you stay sane. Because he has sort of stayed remarkably yeah. sane. If you think about it, I mean, even, even where he lives, okay, so it's like a 15 million pound house in St. John's Wood in London, but it's, it's a house he bought in 1966 that if it was anywhere in the country, it'd look like a, a doctor's house or a lawyer's house. And he's never moved out of it. And then within that huge sprawling estate in, in Sussex, I think he lives quite modestly in the middle of it. And that's a decision because that's not what his peers are doing. That's not what it looks like if he goes round to any other rock stars like Jimmy Page's house down the road, which looks like a castle. It's, it's a choice he's making because he, he must understand on some level that's, that's what keeps him, keeps him grounded. So what's the record that you feel would explain Paul McCartney to a Martian? Well, this was... A, a, um, you, you told me to think about this in advance. And um, I wondered if maybe it would be the, uh, the Hollywood Bowl, just for the screams. Because actually, I was really worried about this Martian, you know, not having the same, maybe not knowing English, maybe not having the same musical vocabulary, maybe it's a different scale. And then I was thinking about the screams. And I wonder, you know, just in terms of making people happy, like what I'd love to show to a Martian is 
all the people in Paul McCartney's wake. So that could be screaming teenage fans, people running across the field at Shea Stadium, or it could be that documentary they made after 9-11, which is him walking around New York, or it could be him with um, James Corden in Liverpool. I think like, to understand what Paul McCartney has given to all of us, and we're so lucky to live on the planet at the same time as him, is, is just like seeing that reaction from people. It is fantastic, isn't it? There's, yeah. there's some footage of Hollywood Bowl, isn't it? Girls just, you know, just, just fainting yeah. and screaming and weeping. And yeah. I don't know why I've watched it so many times, but it's just, there's something really kind of moving about yeah. it. Really. And to put that into the world, and then all the people he has inspired to become musicians yeah. and the amount of happiness that has... I mean, it's just, it, it, you know, it goes on. Do you have a pet theory about Paul McCartney? You asked me this yesterday, and I, like, I feel like most of my time, my, my neutral isn't like mindfulness it's like some like theory that i've got that day about the beatles or the interpersonal dynamics about the beatles and i've completely choked in the face of that question um you know how we if you see him in concert he won't <laughs> david's gonna be annoyed at me for saying this one but um like he won't take a drink of water on stage and if he's interviewed it he'll always say well you know the beatles never took a drink of water on stage it's you know it's not cool it's not professional i thought well you never played for longer than 25 minutes. And when you were in Hamburg, you were doing more than drinking water on stage. Yes, yeah. And I just wondered if it's bladder control. Like, I'm, I'm worried here now. And, <laughs> you know, he's 80. So, so that's my theory. All right. Well, Jeff Floyd, ladies and gentlemen. The Word Podcast. One of the few things you really need in life. Um, we're going to bring on our, our second guest, who's a, a much loved, and much admired, and much respected uh, member of the literary world and author, and the co-host of the, um, the wonderful backlisted podcast. He's also the uh, singer and the keyboard player in the non-lookalike Beatles tribute band Shabby Road. And the last time I was on stage, David and I were on stage with him talking about McCartney. He was wearing an absolutely fantastic uh, magical mystery tour McCartney psychedelic tank top, which I thought he'd be wearing today, but he isn't. He's wearing something else. Andy Miller, come on and explain to us what on earth it is. This is a, he hasn't told us, it's a very specific look. It's a particular moment. In the, oh, okay. <laughs> Welcome. So, Andy, that, that, is, that is from top to toe, is a particular McCartney look, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I like a quiz. So, here's a quiz for you all. What am I, what, what is this a replica of? Would you like me to just. It's black cords, <laughs> red socks, paisley tie, and Grand Takes a Trip. This shirt should be silk, I apologise. <laughs> what is it, Mark? Well, I can date it by the time. It must be 67. It must be 67, late 67, but I can't think what occasion... Is it a Beatles thing or is it a solo McCartney thing? It's a bit of both. So he had turned up at one very public occasion, dressed like that. Post Sgt Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour. It's something to do with Magical Mystery Tour. So it's... Uh, I'll tell you what it is. I'm wearing as close as I can get to what Paul McCartney wore 54 years ago today on his 26th birthday. Oh, very good. Oh, very that good. That is absolutely brilliant. He, now this, you asked me to, you, you said, I know we're going to talk about Paul McCartney stories. This is a brilliant Paul McCartney story. Do you know what he did on his 26th birthday? Go on. So it's 1968, they're back from India, the other Beatles are off doing other stuff. It's his birthday. He has lunch at Apple in Savile Row, and he invites a load of fans in off the streets, the Apple scruffs, and that's who he has his lunch with on his birthday. On his 26th birthday, the biggest pop star in the world still, or one of them. Incredible, isn't it? And this, and this that's is what as he close wore. as I can get. Well, yeah, we're, what an idiot. Thanks for asking me no, to do this. No, no, we love it. We love it. It's fantastic. It's the extra mile. Yeah. That's superb. So when did he first come into your life, Andy? Uh, um, Boxing Day, 6.15pm, Boxing Day, 1973. Which uh, uh, is... uh, uh, People, this young crowd will not believe what I'm about to say. But in the old days, there was no such thing as the Disney Plus channel. (laughs) There were no DVDs, there were no videos... 
Disney was notoriously parsimonious in the extent to which it was willing to let people see any of its product. And it had an arrangement with the BBC to make a programme called Disney Time. Who remembers Disney Time? Oh, yes, yes. And on 6.15 on Boxing Day, uh, 1973, Paul and Linda McCartney presented Disney Time. Oh. And that's, that, that is the first time I can remember knowing who, who that was. Because I, I, I had a vague sense of who the Beatles were. And I knew, Peter Thedes writes about this in his memoir really brilliantly, about how he didn't know who the Beatles were, but he knew who Paul McCartney was. Paul McCartney looked really nice. He, Paul, he, Pete always writes about how he hoped someone would adopt him. Yes. And yeah, he's a bit worried his parents are going to go back to Greece <laughs> yeah. and he wants to, you know, foster parents, doesn't he? And he thinks Paul might be a good, a good option. Probably true. Um, and uh, uh, so he... he um, so, yeah, he's... Uh, uh, what we're we talking about? I totally you talk about your first, how you first saw him on uh, Boxing Day, the on, first, on first encounter. Time. So yeah. that was your first memory. Yeah. So well, you went mom, back I from I said that. to my mum, "What the? Oh, that's Paul McCartney. He was in the he was in the Beatles, Yellow Submarine. I've seen that. That was good, Yellow Submarine. What what happened to the Beatles, Mum? And this was 1973. <laughs> and like your your parents, my mum and dad hated pop music. <laughs> my dad thought it was all a racket literal and metaphorical he thought it was the only music my dad liked was um, this is absolutely true was marching band music and bagpipes <laughs> and the only Paul McCartney record he liked was Mull of Kintyre there you go, there you go. it's true um, but, so I asked my mum I said what happened to the Beatles mum and she said well Paul McCartney's he's still a pop star 1973 and uh, Ringo Starr he's gone into films and John Lennon's gone a bit weird. No, John Lennon. She didn't call him John. John Lennon, he's, he's moved to Amer America with his second wife. <laughs> <laughs> said very carefully. And I said, what was the other one called? She, and she said, George, he's gone very weird. <laughs> so, so if you grew up in the 70s, that presence of Paul McCartney as an actual pop star... Um, the Beatles only really come online in about 76 when, when uh, Hollywood Bowl is, is put out, right? And, and all those singles are reissued and there's a big season of films on the BBC. We went on holiday in 1976, the long hot summer of 1976, to the Isle of Wight. And again, if you wanted to watch Disney time in 1976 in a hotel or anything else, you didn't have um, televisions in the rooms. There was the thing called the TV lounge. Hey, oh, God. And in order, to get, in order for eight-year-old me to see the film Let It Be, I had to sit in the TV lounge from lunchtime through to 6.30pm, well, keep your seat. hogging the TV yeah. with angry holidaymakers <laughs> lining up behind me. Yeah, I mean, watch eight episodes of Softly, yeah. Softly. And when it, gets, when it gets to the bit in the street where the woman goes, oh, this is a load of rubbish, the woman behind me was going, she's right, this is rubbish! <laughs> so, it's the punk rock moment. Yeah. On the Isle of Wight, yeah. Have you ever met him? I don't think you have. But well, I can beat yeah. all of you because I've had the purest form of meeting with Paul McCartney, which is, I've not spoken to him, but we have met, uh, which is that ever since about the age of um, 10, 12, whenever I was allowed to go out to London on my own, still to this day, if I'm in the West End of London, I always, always walk through Soho Square. Just in case. Yeah. Just in case. Just in case he's coming out of the building, and only once has that ever happened. So I was walking, I was walking across Soho Square. I come past, and I turn round, and there's Paul McCartney. And I, I'm, I'm, so I'm seized with thinking, what shall I do? I went, <laughs> <laughs> and he went. There you go. <laughs> so that beats you all. I think that's the purest form of communication you can have with the great man. A we double all... thumbs up, too, not a single, a double. We should have a get back conversation because get back, for, for, for both of you, both of you have seen it, and, and it, it, it completely changed the perception of Paul McCartney. For a lot of people, up, up till then, Lennon seemed to be the perfect um, template for the kind of tortured genius, didn't he? You know, yeah. uh, a mordant, uh, self analytical. Yeah. And McCartney kind of ignored and sidelined for apparently being superficial and whatever, you know. So, Andy, you, you, you had some theories about. What well, my theory is very basic, which is. It was really simple, 
And I think it became clear to me watching Get Back. And it, it really made me understand so many things about the Beatles and about Paul's uh, musical decisions ever since. And it, and it will sound really banal, so hear me out. And it's the simple realization that he is a genius. Now, the other Beatles are very talented, and John Lennon uh, was at pains to point out repeatedly that he believed he was a genius. Paul McCartney never does that. And the reason is because he doesn't have to, because he is a genius. <laughs> a musical genius is what I mean. That there were moments where you could see music flowing through him, or where he would say, well, we could try this harmony line. And he'll put a line on the top that isn't like the bog standard third above. It's a real counter melody that he's come up with with the top of his head. And you can see the other Beatles going, what, we, we do what now? We, 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 you know, in a kind of cooler way. And it made me realize, imagine you were, you were John Lennon with your skiffle group when you were a kid and you accidentally end up with a musical genius in your group. That is going to really fuck you up forever. <laughs> so to be fair, and if you go back to, you know, when they met, I think I'm right in saying this, Jeff, you bear me out, that McCartney is introduced to Lennon and plays and shows off by playing 20 Flight Rock, doesn't he? And he yeah, knows and all the, the words. Yeah, a bunch of stuff after the gig, yeah. And then he does, he does his little Richard yeah. thing. And John Lennon was bright enough to know, this guy's better than I am, but I still want him in my group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, I think you can see the dynamic, though, that there, in Get Back, you can see uh, George spends a lot of time being the, the, the conduit between the two geniuses. Or, 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 like, you, what were you saying? Like, that, the story I was telling about McCartney inviting fans in to share his birthday. That's the last thing George Harrison would do. Yes. There's that brilliant yeah. bit in Get Back where he's going, why would we go on the boat? On the boat? Yeah. Yes. Why would we go on the boat? There'll be all, all these the people fans, there. All these people. <laughs> it's an absolute nightmare for him, the idea, the idea that you have to have fans around you, perhaps justifiably. Um, but, but... So but weirdly, they did all yeah. do that, though. Do you ever look at that website, Meet the Beatles for Real? Yeah. It's so odd in, in like, the, the, what a celebrity looks like now and how removed from their fans a celebrity is yeah. that if you turned up at any of the Beatles' houses, even George, you were quite likely to be invited in for a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, um, oh, can you drive me to Twickenham? I mean, it's insane oh, yeah. how a, accessible they were. A, to that. John invites some really quite unhinged oh, character there's a, there's from a Sweden. Boot, there's a bootleg of um, two American schoolgirls who who were invited into George Harrison's bungalow in Isha, uh, and they've taped the conversation for tw for twenty minutes, and it's out in a boot. And of course, it's it's wonderful because it's like. Do you, do you like going on top of the pops? <laughs> well, it's all right, you know. <laughs> but they, they work their way, they, they're the ones who work their way around the Beatles, and the preceding Beatle would give them the next one's address. Right. Say, so we should go see George. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the only way to get rid of them, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ringo's way. Yeah. But d d going back to get, get Back, I mean, I, I was amazed watching it that, that, that the group had lasted so long, actually, because I would have thought that if you were in a group with somebody like McCartney, it would, although obviously for the, for, the, for the general good, it's wonderful having him there and it improves your song and you think of how he changed, you know, Taxman and, you know, Come Together and you kind of, on Rain and lots of songs you just can't imagine without his contributions, you know. Mm. But the idea that somebody arrives having not just written a song but written a record, and, and can sing every single part yeah, and knows yeah, exactly yeah. how it's going. There's a bit where he's, he plays Maxwell's Silver Hammer and he goes, you do this, you do this, and then there's yeah, this yeah, bit, yeah. then there's an anvil. Then he says at the end, he goes, and that's Maxwell. And, you know, and it's just, he's got the whole thing in his Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think, I, I don't know, it must be really hard to put but, up with that. I wonder whether this, this accounts for some of the solo decisions. Again, I, this, this sounds like I'm being snide. I'm not at all. I think he, he probably hears music differently to the way lots of people do. And so it might seem obscure to us, or even unpleasant, to try and work out what he was reaching for with Bip Bop, but, but he maybe can hear something, some groove or some little melodic twist that we can't quite get our heads around. And, you know, when we get on to talking about the record, I think there's some... You know, he doesn't like this record at all. I really love... There's a, the LP Red Rose Speedway, which is kind of seen as a... 
a flop and where are the Beatles songs? And it, it, for me, that's almost the purest example of his unfettered musicality trying to express itself in different genres, right? Before he then retr retrenches brilliantly into pop music again. It's almost like, hey, this is a great little riff. I've, I'm just going to see where I go with this and see what happens. Um, which must be at odds, Dave, with the thing that you're always saying about him, which is, uh, you both are saying, he wants hits. You know, he wants to have Milkman. We used to have Milkman as well. Whistling, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that used to be Milkman. Um, but so, so there's a tension between following the muse, but also the muse seems to push him into perfectly arranged three-minute pop songs. What do you think of his lyrics? And I'm asking you as a literary man here. Yeah. You know, uh, you know when, when you heard that he's, he's, he's putting out two books of his lyrics, were, were you delighted or, or not? I don't know. This have you, have you read It's them? his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, don't spoil no, it. No, he's capable of... I think, I think you can see within the Beatles. He's always talking about the Beatles being good for him because it edited, they edited him, right? But actually, it probably did push him into trying harder with lyrics. I, I don't think he's... I don't think, with all due... If he's got a good lyrical idea, then he clearly puts his back into it. But a lot of the time, I think it's the musical idea yeah. which is what's driving him. So words can be placeholder words, and maybe they never get developed. Like those, I was listening to, does anyone know a song called Getting Closer from Back to the Egg? No, sorry, I might be going too deep now. No, no. Right, so on, right, on, on um, Getting Closer, that's got a really brilliant tune. It's kind of that late 70s wings, we're a new wave group now, right? And, but it's got this terrible lyric around, but around the world's word salamander. And it, I was listening to it on the way up, and I'm really, my foot's pumping, and I'm going, yeah, I'm going to Paul McCartney's birthday party. Let's go to Salamander. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so some, but, but, you know, you hear all those stories about producers who will say to him, Paul, I don't think that's good enough. And, and he allegedly will say, well, how many hits have you had? Well, it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of a fair point. Yeah. Isn't maybe it, maybe really? that is the change version, though. Maybe he's, he, uh, he needs somebody when he says, oh, I'll change that for them to go. You won't, you won't, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, everybody says... And I love like, about being a fan that those words have become shorthand. Just that, that anecdote is so Everybody well who works with him says the same thing, that he always says the same thing about Sergeant Pepper. If you try and disagree with him and point something out, he says, so, people said that Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was a bad idea for an album title. I rest my case. And of course, you're, yeah. you're kind of neutered, aren't you? What can People you say? say it's too long, you know. Yeah. The, bloody, the bloody Beatles White Album. Shut up! <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that's my favourite yeah, quote yeah, in the yeah, anthology. Yeah, yeah. It says, shut up, it's the Beatles White, yeah, Beatles Beatles White Album. It's like, you know, because there's a serious point there. He is the biggest Beatles fan, he isn't is, he? He is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that is the key. There's no bigger Beatles fan than Paul McCartney. I used to irritate the other members of the Beatles very much because George particularly would say... I see Paul's promoting his new album with our this stuff. This is it. <laughs> but he doesn't, and he doesn't need to. You know, you were talking about Miles. When I, I, Miles' book, was it, it's called Many Years From Now, yes. is it? I kept reading that where McCartney was always, in that book, McCartney's always going, well, you know, I think this song was 70% uh, uh, me and 30% John. You want to go, relax, mate, you're Paul McCartney. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sounds it's desperate. All right. There was an awful moment when he tried to get some songs changed to McCartney Lennon, didn't he? Instead of yeah. Lennon McCartney, yeah. once he had the upper hand in, and somebody just eventually took him out for a quiet word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't, he is the last person to want to throw daylight on magic where the Beatles right. are concerned. Whereas yeah. George was very keen to do that all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, that's true, I think. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Is that why he's still, you know, still doing this at, uh, at 80, you know, he'd be playing tonight probably somewhere. I was, I was thinking when McCartney 3 came out um, and went to number one all over the world. Oh, incidentally, I must say, uh, it's amazing that um, there's actually a Paul McCartney album at number one all over the world right now to celebrate his birthday, and it's by Harry Styles. <laughs> Has anyone heard that record? If anyone had told me the hot sound of 2022 would be let them in, I, would, I wouldn't have believed them. But it is, it's like a McCartney 80s record. It's like a kind of ram album. Extraordinary, no, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, so I think he's just kind of... I think you've said before, being Paul McCartney must be quite good. To know that you can record an album at home and you can find a way of presenting it to the world, which is what I think he's so brilliant at. The record is okay, but the, what, the campaign they put around that record was utterly brilliant about talking about the, um, the, the, the Beatles and McCartney in a way that would appeal to a much younger audience to talk about the fact that they refused to play segregated shows, that, um, that, uh, uh, the, the work that his mother had done in the health service. You know, they were pushing very specific, specific buttons. buttons. Yeah, they were. And um, in a sense, it, I mean, I think that record is fine, but it's still amazing that he's here and he cares enough to make a good record and want it to be number one and go to the trouble of thinking about how he can sell it to people. Well, he's, that sense of competition, I think if you give up on that, there's not much point in doing it, actually. Yeah. And I can remember interviewing him in, in 1982, and, and uh, he put his single back two weeks. And I said, why have you done that? He said, well, I found out that ABBA and the Human League were coming out the same day. And I kept thinking, but this is McCartney. Wait a minute, because it mattered so much that he was number one. It mattered so much that he breaks records. He yeah. broke a record once, didn't he, for playing in Milan to, was it 350,000 people, I think, at a free concert? And it, I think the Stones then beat it the next year or something like that. But he just still wants to be. Yeah. And the fact that he's headlining Glastonbury, you know, there's, yeah, um, yeah. there's no point in doing it unless you really want to win. Do you think it's mildly. also where, where what drives 18 year old musicians is the thing, is the idea, it always seems to me that someday you will all recognize how wonderful I am, you know? <laughs> He's, he's got that, hasn't he? Yeah. That, it still drives him at the age of 80. You know what I mean? That the whole nation stops to recognise what that guy has done in I a lifetime. I love what you guys were talking about, about how he does, how he stayed normal. I think there's a massive... Um, it's like a hall of mirrors, that. Right? Yeah. I don't believe um, that a man who has lived the life he has and had the opportunities to visit the countries he's had and sample the best cuisine from all over the world. When he says, what's your favorite food? Egg and chips. <laughs> I simultaneously think, you probably do really like egg and chips. I'm not saying you do, it's not a lie, but it's a very deliberate choice about how he, how he puts himself forward. Yeah, yeah. I get on buses. Yeah. I get on the tube. But he does. But he does, right? But he's, but he's always going like that. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to do that. No. There's also but, something about his sense of himself as, and, and again, in a likable, not in an obnoxious way, as a, as a protagonist in the, the film that is his yeah, own life. That's really when true, he Jeff. talks yeah, yeah. about kind of writing yeah. Michelle and he sees himself as, uh, you know, uh, trying to woo a French girl at a party, I think there's something about that, and he, he will like the idea of himself taking a bus, and that's part of why he takes a bus, but then somehow that connects him to normality. That's yeah, the, the that outcome anyway. There's that song, That Was Me, isn't there? That's yeah, song, quite yeah, a yeah. One, with, with, with him saying, yeah, I did that, that was me, I, I, I played in front of those people, I... Yeah, so I don't know. I think he really do, he doesn't like having his own memories um, reflected back at him as, as different versions of events, which, you know, is true for all of us. And in Get Back, it's been this gift for him, I'm sure, because if yeah. you think about why people go into therapy, to, to be able to take this time of your life, which I think traumatised all four of them to, to some degree or other. Now, they, they were kind of retrospectively perhaps applying stuff onto it, but to, to be able to see it and think oh, it wasn't like that, and I was right, and all yeah, those things absolutely. that I was you know, so hung up about people having wrong about me. Yeah, but also, yeah and also but had been made to apologise for, or yes. expected yes. to apologise for, for decades, by the other Beatles and then by all of us going, what'd you, why'd you do it? You know, why'd you do it, Paul? Well, he, he didn't, but, but, but <laughs> it turns out. So the question you haven't answered, Andy, is what record of Paul McCartney would you use to explain him to a Martian? Uh, I would choose, at the risk of going Alan Partridge, I would definitely choose Silly Love Songs. I think you go for the best of the Beatles album. <laughs> <laughs> I really love Silly Love Songs. Uh, there's, se there's, se well, there's several reasons why. The first is the musical facility of it is absolutely incredible. It is the sort of um, QED of what I was talking about, about, his, his, about music flowing through him. There's no song there 
Not really. There's a nice middle eight to make it feel like a song, but what it really is is a series of riffs and counter melodies stacked up on top of one another. It's got Linda singing on it. Okay, well, that's part of the McCartney story. It's got a disgruntled employee, Denny Lane, singing on it. <laughs> that's part of the McCartney story, isn't it? You know, that, that, that uh, aspect of it. But also, I think... And also, it's, it's, a, it's supposedly... It's, that Silly Love Song is inspired... As, it's a, an answer record to John Lennon. John Lennon's saying, oh, all Paul does is Silly Love Song. So Paul, in his most happy, clappy, passive-aggressive way, is going, what's wrong with that? <laughs> to, 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 for six minutes, no song. But ultimately, what I really love about it is it is a record about Paul McCartney. Um, you think that people would have had enough of Paul McCartney. <laughs> I look around me and I see it isn't so. <laughs> Some people want to fill the world with Paul McCartney. And what's wrong with that, I'd like to know. <laughs> Andy Miller, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very hey. much. Egg and chips. There's a massive thumbs up going on over there. Egg and chips. <laughs> and at that, at that point, we're going to have a break. Uh, please get a drink, and uh, we'll see you back here in about 20, 25 minutes for the second half. Thanks very much. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. <laughs>